Foto, EPA slash Jim Rose Die Hochzeitssaison hat begonnen und mit ihr die Zeit der Jungs in den Abschnitt. Bei dem die Partner die letzten Abend den Vorhalt vorbringen. Umso überraschter war ich, dass ich an eben einem solchen Abend meine erste Begegnung mit einem FRE-Tag im realen Leben machte. Die kleinen Schicks dienen eigentlich dazu, Gegenstände wie Schüssel oder Geldbörsen per GPS mit dem Handy aufzuspulen. Wenn man sie verloren hat, angesagt am Abend wandte mich mein Telefon jedoch, dass ich ein fremder Tag mit mir überlebt. Die Braut hatte nämlich den Bräutigam einen solchen Schick in die Jagdtasche gesteckt. Damit hier keine falschen Eindrücke entstehen, als ich den Bräutigam darauf ansprach, grinste er nur wissend und betonte, dass er von dem Schick wisse, er ist nämlich aus Fremd und der Tag sollte ihm bei der Koordinierung der Heimfahrt helfen. Eigentlich clever, auf ihn angetracht der Tatsache, dass bei besonders feuchtfröhlichen heute Wochenenden im Ausland einzelne Freunde gerne einmal eine ganze Nacht Spur und Planlos in Gedümmel verschwinden. Überrascht hatte mich aber, dass ich die Warnung erst nach ein paar Stunden bemerkte. Denn zu Beginn des Abends war ich im Gespräch vertieft, ohne auf mein Handy zu blicken, das geschah erst, als ich vor einem Club in der Warteschlange stand. Räumlich getrennt vom Bräutigam und somit auf der Möglichkeit beraubt, den Tag mit dem Handy zu deaktivieren. In der Praxis nach Richtung, was inzwischen schon Gesetzgeber und Gerichte beschäftigt, dass die unscheinbaren Ehrtags für versuchtes Streiten genutzt werden können und das, wofür Apple auch kritisiert wird, die Warnungen zu spät und zu unauffällig erscheinen. In den USA wird bereits an schärferen Gesetzen gearbeitet, um dem entgegenzuwirken, was wichtig ist, um potenzielle Opfer zu schützen. Zum Selbstschutz und zum Schutz beliebter Menschen ist das Leben aber eigentlich legitim. Und wer auch etwas vernaut ziemlich, wenn sie Lust kaufen sollen und dabei wieder einmal, versehentlich, im Elektrofachhandel verloren gehen, Stefan May, 19. Mai 2022. Nach Windows 2022, 10. 20.348 ist irgendwo zwischen B10 und B11, zumindest kein 10 mehr. Die sollen erstmal ein richtiges Suche für ihr Betriebssystem implementieren, wo jeder dann nach bestimmten Datei übrigens suchen kann, wo man einfach festlegt, ob man jetzt nach Dateinamen oder Inhalten in der Datei sucht. Einfach eine Suche, die intuitiv und brauchbar ist. Ich weiß auch nicht, was das für eine Suche ist. Hat man den Ordner, Hautruder, dann findet er exemplarisch mit dem Suchbegriff. Hau oder Hauder, den Ordner, aber nicht mit Tutor. Wenn zum Beispiel ein Ordner und eine Datei den Namen, Kurzbeschreibung, tragen, dann findet er mit dem Suchbegriff, Kurzbeschreibung, beides und mit Beschreibung, nur den Ordner. Dem Kollegen von mir den Computer ist hier aufgefallen, dass Microsoft die erste ISO-Installationsdatei für Windows 11 Insider Bullets im Developer-Kanal freigegeben hat. Konkret hat Microsoft die Windows 11 Insider Bullets 25.120 als ISO-Download im Insider-Portal freigegeben. Windows 11 ISO vor Insider in der Bitupa-Chain. Die Kollegen von Discord haben einige Hinweise und Downloads dieser Bullets in diesem Beitrag bereitgestellt. Hallo. So, since a few people are still missing, that would be the great opportunity to ask a few questions. So, are there any questions? Okay. So the hash table for every hash value that it uh, for which it for which it has space will implement a linked list such that you can store multiple entries under the same hash value. So uh, the entries in a hash table are identified by a key value. So unlike a list where you just have a collection of values, in a hash table those values have assigned unique, normally unique identifiers. There are also implementations where you can uh, have multiple elements with the same, same ID. But in the most common ones you have only one ID per element and find my, my entry does exactly that. It finds an element given a identifier. So if you, for example, would make a phone book, that's a good example, <coughs> then you would want to find entries by the name of uh, whomever you are looking for. And this is what the function would do. Uh, 
Um, let's uh, quickly open the source code and let me share my screen. Bildschirm freigeben, Nummer 3. Um, hash table. So here we have our hash table um, implementation. Find my entry. Okay, so we are here, and what we want is, as said, we want to find a data object by a given key. So first, we calculate the hash value. Then we use this get bucket. So the buckets, as you can, so this gives us the index. So the buckets, as such, is an array, um, and this array. To access any element, you need an index from within the bounds of the array, so it, it should not never be outside. This function generates us this index, and here from from the buckets array, we can get the right bucket. And this bucket is a linked list of entries, where every entry got the same hash value, or rather, were within the available size of the bucket array, um, the the index generated from the hash value was the same, and then it looks inside and matches exactly the key such that we only get a result if the key matches exactly and not if it's just by accident a key that gives the same hash value as another key that we have but is not otherwise identical it compares two memory regions with a given length so you give two pointers one, one memory address, another memory address and here um, you have the uh, that is also wrong, that should be equal and then you have the length of the memory that it compares and on success it returns zero so if the memory is the same it retu returns zero and if the memory is not the same it returns either plus or minus one depending on the inner semantics so you can use it to sort like which string is larger than than another one and then you would get plus or minus one so Normally, if you just want uh, to compare for equalness, you just make is equal zero or is, or is non equal zero as the r for the result of mem compare. Okay, so the bucket as such is, po is a pointer. Uh, to a pointer, uh, or rather it's an array of pointers and we d we first get a value from this hash table which is entry and if we have an entry in this bucket then this will not be null so, and, and if the entry is empty, beca because we could for example uh, want an, a result for a key which never was stored in the hash table, that could happen um, and in this case entry would be null and we would not be able to execute the compare so then if it's null we don't do anything if it's not null we enter we make a compare and if it if we succeed we return to data pointer if we do not succeed we then check in our linked list we get the next entry in the list we set ent we set entry to our next entry and then we repeat the loop and of course if there wouldn't be no next entry then pnext would be null and then this check would say false and then we would return here um, so we would break out of the loop and go to this return null and return zero indicating that mm, there is no result with the required or rather with the requested key or for the requested key one should rather say okay, thank you. okay. good any more questions Because that's how the function is defined. We want something, we want arbitrary data, just identified by the identifier. We might not know, we usually don't know what the data will be, because if you would know, then you wouldn't need them in the first place, but we have the key. So, like with the example with the phone book, you know, know someone's name. Um, in this case, it's of course not a perfect example, because these are very exact matches, so you would need to have the exact name of the guy you want to find, uh, with all commas, uh, semicolons, and whatever he might have inside. Um, but the working principle is the same. You have a key and you want the data for this key. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. It's the second case. So actually, you have two uh, steps here where we lose, the, um, let's say, lose available key entropy. So the key here, as entered, can be an arbitrary long amount of memory. So it can be a kilobyte, or you can write a poem as a key. But as soon as we generate a hash value, the the whole data will be reduced to just one 32-bit number. So at this point, we only have four billion possible combination. So already if you would know that you will have more than 4 billion entries in your hash table, you know that you will not you can never got un you get unique hash values. And the second step where we reduce this even further is here this get bucket uh, get my bucket uh, I mean which when we look inside what it does in principle is it masks off the upper portion of the of this 32 bit number such that we only get the lower few bits uh, in the quantity required to uh, fill to access the whole um, index space of our bucket array so I for example if you have only let's say 16 entries uh, in total then your total entropy will be like four, four bits or so so it will be very likely that you might uh, might generate um might use multiple keys with the same value in in this example <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then we can continue with the other f uh, funny features of C++. So, as I already indicated last time, uh, C++ not only um, allows you to define your own types with uh, functions as members, but you can also define uh, custom operators such that you can uh, then use uh, your various types that you have defined yourself. Um, as if they would be machine type, so you can make plus minus, for example, as an operator. Uh, you are limited to some extent to wi to which operators you can. Um, it's called overload uh, because you can only overload those operators that would exist. So you cannot invent an operator as a c that would not exist. Like for example, uh, the plus equals operation is defined, so you can override the plus equals operator, but you could not, for example, invent. Uh, I don't know um what would be a good example of something that yeah for example a dot equals would not be allowed so actually the the dot as such which which you have seen uh being used um or the arrow they both can be overloaded as operators um but uh, you you could not then com combine this with with for example another Signed to generate something that is not as such existing in the language, so we can only modify existing ones, and we can um, try that. So we can implement here another potentially useful helper class. Um, actually, we already kind of started it uh, with one of th was that in the head? I know it was somewhere abstract. Uh, I think we started that, didn't we? Um, was it called my array? Uh, few at least. Uh, yeah. So mm, I see array. We made a very simple example that allows us to hold an array. Mm, basically, in the way we would hold. Um, so this takes care, as I explained the last time, for of memory deallocation. So this array thingy allows us to set and get elements but what we cannot yet do with it is we cannot really um, use it the same way we would use normal a normal LA, uh, array in C++ so when, so when we uncomment this and maybe comment that out if zero up to here if okay. so don't care for that. 
So a normal array and a normal integer array, array int int array, also 100 size. Here, if you are accessing the members, you are just using the square bracket operator and giving some index. Oops, really good. And giving just some index. And with our array yet, you could not do that. If we try that, it will just complain that it does not work because the square bracket operator, as such, is not yet uh, known to. Uh, to our class, so it's not defined for our class, and we can uh, define that. So we can go to our definition here, and we make um, what was that? Um, we have the return type was int, so we have an uh, int reference. We can we should be able we should be av even able to make operator. Um, does it then take? Then it should take the index. Um, and return. Well, actually, we can use this get at index. No, we cannot because we want to return a uh, reference. So here we want to be able to also write to whatever's in the array, hence we return the reference. So we need to just copy the content. Um, and we call this position to so for some reason, let's call this position as well. Of course, the, then we cannot return zero because we need to return an, a reference. So we need to create a dummy object, int m, uh, which we should probably initialize with zero. So th th this, of course, now up to up to one's uh, preference. If you have a function that returns a reference to something, you need to, in fact, return a reference to something. So this is like a sort of hidden pointer because internally this is really just returning a pointer but uh, f by being defined as, as a reference the, the way you can handle these variables then internally makes <coughs> everything uh, behave as if that would be just a, a normal non-pointer type variable so you cannot return a value because if you try to return a value then the question would be to, to where the value would be returned so you need a memory address so one option is here to just um, create a dummy variable, so so whenever someone tries to access an invalid um, offset, he will just access this dummy variable, which is presumably a very not great solution. And normally, you would rather want to throw an exception if um, this happens, because this way you have a silent error. You're doing something that's not sensical, but the the application continues execution. So probably you don't want this but this would work what you could also do is um, you could try to uh, somehow return a null pointer as a reference so that um, in principle could work uh, I don't need to be static um, I don't know instant is equals null and then we kind of uh, dereference this um why does this complain is right now it's really also fine. And now um it will create a proper crash if you try to access any point outside because then it will give you the null address which always generates a memory viol violation. So with this implementation we can try it out. So here first we have of course our just assign one to the array. We can run it and then see that it actually worked as expected. Um, to mediate, uh, how did we call our data? It was the dot. Um, m array, m array at offset number two, and it has the value we expected. So if we would access another offset, then it's not defined. There is just garbage in, in that area. But the offset two we have changed and worked as expected. Now if we try to access offset mm, 100 and 1 for example, that's uh, actually even more than invalid. So we, uh, uh, the index of 100 would already not be valid since um, if it has 100 elements, it's element 0 till 99. But here I just used 101, th which uh, I said returns a null pointer, and then you get a null pointer exception. 
um, despite the fact that you are operating with uh, references and not just uh, pointers here. So this is already one example of such a uh, operator that you can override, uh, overload. Um, and what we could also do is we could define a few other operators. Um, well, for an array, this does not really. Well, most of the operators don't really make sense. We could make like a plus operator that would allow us to append an element uh, at to the back of the array, so grow the array uh, and just append something. So that would be one example of what operators could have a reasonable sense for for an array. Um, but normally, uh, those using most of the operators would be rather reserved for implementing, um, for example, as I said last time, a number which is not represented by a machine type but can be arbitrarily large, for example. So here we have an example of such a implementation. This is just a very simple integer class which uh, allows you to operate with arbitrarily sized um, or rather in this particular case it's implemented such that you can when you create this object you can define what size of integer you want to operate with and then all those integers of this type will have this size so in this particular case we implement a unsigned int 128 bits but we could also um, by changing this union here um, use um, just 64 bits although for 64 bits uh, in on the 64 bit system we already have a native machine type so that would be only reasonable on a 32 bit platform or we could also go to 126 bits um, and you see here the implementations for the different um, for the different operators and how and how they work so we have um, XOR so exclusive or plus minus multiplication division assignment operator uh, this is actually one that pr would make sense to implement for an array, so we can do that. Um, the idea with an assignment operator is that uh, if you use a normal assignment, we can first maybe try to do it the non-proper way. So let's create another array, my, my array 2. And normally, if this would be normal integers, you could, or, or normal types of any... Why is it complaining? Because we need to tell it how big it should be. Um, say zero will that cause a crash I'm not sure how we implemented the constructor um new from inside that is probably not the greatest thing to do let's make size larger zero then do this else null and here if this then delete Although you can call delete on null, uh, this will check internally. Actually, since we are allowed to do it, we don't need to do it again. So internally, uh, it checks whether whatever you pa pass to it is null, and if it's null, then that just doesn't do anything. But in our other functions, we should also check if array is null because uh, we don't want to allow for any accesses to invalid memory here as well. Right here. Um, good. So let's go back to our example. And here, if you would now try to assign one object to the other, like with normal integers, you could. Um, in fact, you see that this thing does not complain. So it did it. The compiler is, is fine with that. Um, despite that, this is a very bad idea. You will see in a minute why. Uh, if because if we try to run it, that should cause a crash. Um why is that does not why does that does not like null? Um uh, seems we included this somewhere uh where we don't have the definition of um uh, my array h my h um so this is of course one of the things that it's annoying with C++ that you have to be careful with your includes. Okay, we included it here, and we don't include anything on top of it that we might need. So this includes need to go first, uh, because one of them contains our definition for null. Uh, I guess string a is... I mean, they are all std includes, so they will just include some header. But now here, you see I said we caused a crash. Um, and we, if we go to our call stack, you will see that it's from the destructor. And at this point, of course, uh, we only see that uh, we close the scope here, 
you don't really see whether it was a destructor for array 1 or array 2 um, presumably it would be the destructor actually for array 1 because what happens now if we try to step through it step by step you will see that we will actually enter uh, the, con the destructor two times so here you see in the assembly we have two calls to a, to a, to a destructor for different arrays uh, for different array names uh, this is for one and for the two, so let's see uh, here if we define it. So this one is the is this which of this we have we have the one e seven one e eight and one b eight. So here one e eight is the first one. Uh, one b eight is the first array, and one e eight offset is the second array. And first we call the first destructor that will work just fine. We can step over that. And then if we call the other one, um, once we arrived far enough, okay, we don't need this thingy. Uh, yeah, that will be a lot of clicking around. The point is, at some point here we will. If I just make a step out of the function, we'll run into the error. The problem, what we are experiencing, is that this assignment operation, if it doesn't have a defined operator, what it will do is, it will be equivalent to just a memcopy. And uh, doing a memcopy on a object is almost always a very bad idea. So if you have any sort of uh, classes uh, that are non-trivial, non then you should never memcopy them. So memcopying structs, if they don't have any um, inheritance and, and don't have any uh, pointer types, uh, is fine. If they have pointer types, then you will need to adjust the pointers. Um, but here in this case, um, if we have a complex class with, with internal mechanics, memcopying it is a really, really bad idea, simply because um, this operation is not aware that you are duplicating objects. So, I mean, it's duplicating the data, but it doesn't know that this data points to objects which should have individual treatment. So, if we if we we would run this, this would be the same. So this we we'll just write it, and we don't need to see the crash again. What we actually want to do um, when we are copying an object will be. We want to create a new array, new pointer with an array of the right size. We want to copy the data to it and mm, update all the other variables that we have, uh, like size. In this case, in this case, we only have size, but that's the gist of it. So let's implement that quickly. Um, so let's make a uh, array reference equals. Um, const other um, uh, this. Okay, and internally first what we want, so we are copying an another object onto this object we have now, so first of all we delete whatever we have. Second step is um, we will be overwriting size with the other objects that's a pointer size value. Um, we should change this logic here slightly. Then we'll be creating a new array of the new size that is required and now we will be copying just the data from one object to the other. Array uh, other punct and array compa comma and array uh, size is times uh, size of int. And now, if we do the assignment operator, uh, yeah, that is then uh, we will su successfully uh, semicolon is missing duplicate the object in a way that will make everything work properly. So the problem before was that both objects had the same value as m array, and that's why the 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 code then called the destructor on this array on the same memory twice and uh, so you basically try to free a memory block and then which first time works and then you try to free the same memory block which already was freed which caused the crash now 
since every object has its own memory block, the destructors are again working as they should. And uh, there is also another scenario where this um, can be useful, um, or where this can, where, where such a mechanics can lead to problems. Normally, you have a constructor, as you see here, with IntelliSense. There are two constructors available for this object: the one that takes the size and one that takes another instance of this object. But when we take a look here, we only have defined this one a constructor that takes size. The compiler by default creates a constructor which would make a du duplicate, but this constructor will be prone to the same issues like the simple assignment operation. Um, it will cause a crash <laughs> in the same place because internally it again will just be a copy. So now here we need to implement an own copy constructor such that uh, this operation also works uh, successfully and in principle we just for the most part can copy already our implemented um, assignment operator. The, uh, the, the other option, the quicker option would actually be not to even copy it but really just exploit it it's equals by first setting whatever needs to be set so we need a uh, array to be null it otherwise it will be undefined and this operation will crash if it's null it's fine and then we, we assign so this will just invoke that which will f in the first case just do nothing um, and then it will assign everything correctly so now we will see with these two new functions that um, where there was the example here uh, that now we are able to not just assign properly but also co create uh, copies of our object again um, properly. So here we see we managed to exit the scope, the two destructors were called successfully and nothing bad happened. Um, any questions at this point? No questions? Okay. So let's continue. Um, the next, well, I guess at this point we can really start with templates. Yeah. Um, the next very powerful func feature or functionality of C is it allows you to create templates. So let's create a new. Uh, Test project for that. To create new project. Console app. Mm -hmm. um, let's call it template test. So the idea behi te behind templates is that you can write some code without having to specify a one or more types and then the compiler will generate for you copies of your of whatever code you have created and insert for you the right type. So we can create a couple a template function template <coughs> type name t Let's make the simplest function of of them all. T is sum is um, T A comma T B uh, Abstand T A T B and return A plus B. That is super trivial, but already demonstrates how these uh, templates work. So to a compa to to compare it, we can implement a handmade function just for integers int e i sum let's call this just sum with a large s int a int b oops i forgot the t um, return a plus b and return a plus b so um, now first we will try just a normal simple function int E A is like one, two, three, and E B is like uh, five, six. 
double F A square one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That then we don't have enough uh, let us um let's go with that. And double F B six seven eight nine point null why not? Um yeah well so if we use first um int um, let's call it c it's a our normal function with the integer type of input it will work just fine it will generate the exact result we want but if we use it uh, for the doubles then it will uh, still return a double but it will convert to an integer oops I copy paste fail just here and here should be f um, and it will by converting to ints drop the decimal point so if we now put a breakpoint here and see what happens we see that in, um, was it complaining? sure that should be an f <sighs> and, uh, of course even if it throws a warning that you will be losing data doing so but we here see in practice that we in fact uh, lose the decimal point so it's just comma zero 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 and if we would be using our template function instead, if we replace this with, with just our template function, it will now create two copies of this function, one where t is replaced with int, one where t is replaced with double, and then uh, both operations, despite the, the fact that we are using the same function, will uh, be exactly successful. So here we see that our decimal points were preserved. Now it, it, there is some um, loss of accuracy if you are using doubles, always so in this case it's very minute but you can see it it's not exactly what we typed but for the other one it worked fine and also the compiler did not throw any exceptions uh, or warnings and um, this now here maybe seem quite trivial but you can use this template method to create uh, very sophisticated implementations for example we can create here a new uh, alone a new class one interesting th uh, or peculiar, well, in a way it's obvious, by, but one feature that is unlike the rest in C++ with regard to uh, where you put your code is uh, w if you create template classes, because then uh, effectively you need to put all, all your code into the header file. If you try to put a portion of your template file into a C++ file, it, unless you really know what you are doing, it is very likely that we, you will just end up with in, with unresolvable linker errors. Simply because once it's the C++ file is generated, the compiler is not aware of for which types those uh, functions would be used, so it will not generate any of them. And then all of them that were defined in your header will be missing once they are tr tri tried to be used. Uh, there is a way around it. You can um, manually specify that you want the compiler to create certain implementations of your template um, but um, usually it's just much easier to just put everything in the header and if you need a larger amount of code uh, that would do something you could try to write this code in a way that it would be type independent and then put this code in your into your cpp file and just only the type dependent stuff put into your header mm, so we will do that now and create another very useful uh, small helper. Let's call it uh, scoped pointer h. Um, we start again with template template type name t. You could also write tape uh, template class that will be pretty much equivalent. So if you l read old code usually people always use template class in newer code I most o most often see template uh, just type name it's more typing but it's more explicit because if you write class then you would kind of expect that it probably will be a class but it doesn't have to be like with our early example a uh, integer works also fine so a class c my scope my scope pointer uh, we don't derive it from anything we make most things public, so we start with a constructor um, and we need the t asterisk, so we don't specify which type, just a pointer we say that this will be a pointer of some not yet closer specified type and we need a private variable could also be protected but let's do it private for now t asterisk m p 
which is our pointer and here we can initialize it wherever we want with our original value and then we just also add it with a destructor which only job will be to uh, free our variable. So this is to a way uh, very similar to the my array helper we created earlier but it's not quite the same since here you can feed arbitrary objects with so the, the array thing was just a holder for an array of a given type we can later in fact upgrade that um, to us to work with arbitrary types <coughs> but for now let's concentrate on this and what we also would want is a way to access this pointer ideally in a way that um, we will not see a difference in everyday behavior let's say between uh, this special class and a normal pointer so what we can do is here we can define the asterisk I think uh, operator we can override the asterisk operator with return our pointer and this will allow us to create an object of this type and despite that the object will be allocated on the on the stack you will be able to use the as the error operator on it to access the internal pointer it holds uh, in this case the pretty much only main function of this helper class is to ensure that we will delete it so what we probably might want is an option uh, to delete it before we s we are done with the scope so let's add a function clear mm. yeah. I call it clear because the delete queue is already a reserved keyword so we cannot really use it and one thing that to think about of course is that then we need to set this null such that if we would try to access it later it would cause an error and what we also might want might be a function that would allow us to take the pointer as a pointer and not have it uh, necessarily deleted so we call it detach and here what we do is just uh, we make a temporary copy the asterisk return. we set this to null and we return the copy we made so at this point we can use the detach function to take full control over our pointer and pass it along somewhere where some other mechanism uh, will need to take care of freeing it once it's done but often you might be in a situation where you want to do some things to an object and only once you are done doing those things um, only then you want to pass it along for further processing and you would like to be able to exit of your function at any point in time with a return instead of having to delete and then return so this for example would be a very useful use case so let's try it out uh, so well, let's create some arbitrary helper type um, actually that would be better placed in our other example so let's just copy maybe some type from our example so we just copy let's copy this thing it is simple enough that was the wrong ah yes I should make it slightly bigger um yeah well so we have our, our class 2 which does not do much yeah it's good enough uh, we could add here a printf do we have printf included? Um, yesterday you have yesterday give printf um, so that we see that is actually doing what we wanted to do then here the distractor okay so the way we are supposed to use this helper class is we uh, find a pointer we feed it a new instance of something and that should that uh, we need to include it now it's still uh, unknown so we need also here include um, this thingy um, at least is easy no it's not I will turn around for this one um, ah so sure, we need to tell it which type this should be um, 
So sometimes the thing is able to figure it out on its own, but in this case it did not. Um, now let's make you a printf. Ah, yes, we went also uh, new lines to make it look nicer in the debug log. So the idea is that here we create it, so this will, of course, we see here the constructor being invoked, zack, this line. Then we do something, we could do much more, but for now it's fine to just one line. And then when we exit the scope of, the of this pointer variable, it will automatically um, invoke the destructor. Though maybe at this point we also should uh, demonstrate the error operator, so let's just do that as well, uh, but this will no longer need uh, to be protected because we want to be able to access this thing. Uh, so we can go here. Uh, why is that? Comp ah, that should be an asterisk. Um, hello. Uh, s let me check quick. No, wait. Okay. So first of all, this was fine because we are making a pointer out of that and this should be why is it not working? Um <laughs> did we not make the things public? No we made everything public here. Um for some reason that does not do what we wanted to do. Um chim 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 is public that should be right um, for f first let's just try to compile it and maybe it will update. Okay, something's missing. Uh, did I forgot the semicolon? No, I did not. Um, Ah, shit. I had the E and the P <laughs> switched. That is not ideal. Yeah, now it compiles fine. Um, so again, where were we? Zack, zack. My func. So we can call a function on... kind of on this thing, but what we are really calling is a function on this object and not on that, since we are using... since we overload this error operator. So now let's run it. And voila. Is the here we have our constructor, then we have our function, and then we have the destructor called automatically. So this is a very useful um, class. You can use it in your own projects in future. Of course ideally probably you might want to add some more functionality to it, but as a very basic demonstration of templates and um, also the ability to create own operators. This is also very very nice to have. Any more qu any questions at this point? No questions. Okay, so um, what else might be worth saying? Such uh, s type of pointers or pointer holding objects are called smart pointers. This is a particularly simple example because it only handles the case where you want to manage a pointer within a scope. But you can create um, more complex smart pointers which would even allow you to uh, copy a pointer from one object to the next and reference count it. So that here we would have a variable that contains a value that represents how many of these objects have a reference on whatever target object we have. Um, of course for this to work we would need to introduce one additional helper object because this, if you have multiple uh, instances of this thing then obviously the other instance cannot access the other instance's variable so they would need some internal object which they could share. Um, normally this is implemented such that um, you expect this reference counting to be done directly on the object which you are feeding to it, so in this case we could not f uh, put uh, any class into our smart pointer but just classes which are derived from our intended smart pointer base but there are ways how you could try to implement it with an additional helper object such that you ca could also work with arbitrary 
objects that you that you pass to it, even if they are unaware that they are supposed to be handled by a smart pointer. And the standard template library also provides a, a couple useful smart pointer types that can be used in projects. So, like for string and other things, um, there is a lot of of those things already implemented. Um, good. So, since there are no more no questions. So are there still no questions or did anyone came up with a question about templates? Do you need more examples of templates or is this already uh, clear enough? Um, okay, no one's saying anything. Um, we can check out a few template classes which are provided by the standard template library so for example the std map class it would be um, actually we could s even use something that is just like our hash table uh, was it hash or was it hash table what was the name uh, or was it hash map one moment, please. So the normal map is just a, a binary tree, which which I mentioned last time that this is rather complicated to implement. STD. Uh, it, they have implementations for lists and okay. Uh, so they changed this recently, and nowadays this thing is called uh, unordered map. So the ha the because ba in basically in a way okay we need to include that. Uh, this is how this works. So a normal map with a tree. Um, would for require f in order to work a operator that tells it which value is larger and which is smaller and it will organize all the objects uh, based on this operator so so in this semantics they will be organized from the smallest to the biggest and uh, in a hash map since you are generating hash values which look at least random um, they will not uh, they will basically just put your values into functionally random positions in your table. So that's why they renamed that, but we can now provide it with, t with two keys, uh, so sorry, with a key and a value, let's say as a key we want um, an integer and as a value we want a string and let's call it digits. That is a almost too simple example, but why not? Um, we have an insert function that takes a pair, that takes also a pair. Okay, we could just uh, go with that. Here is equals. Two is. Yeah, and so on. So here you see that um, it all it implements quite a nice set of functionality. Uh, you can use an over overwritten um, square brackets operator to access the elements by key. So actually, if you would maybe swap this, that would be m would be more impressive uh, because you will see that you can use just normal strings as keys. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of that happens here under the hood that the compiler hides from us. So first of all it will create an object of type string on the stack, then it will initialize it with well the string the C string zeros, then it will pass this string to our template of our uh, unsorted un unordered map and this will return it a pointer to an integer inside this map and then it will assign zero to it. So we can actually put a breakpoint here and turn off all these things that make the code look ugly and then take a short look um, optimizations, cogeneration, nope so this has to go this has to be nope, anything else we don't want that might already be enough and what, sorry, one more thing uh, what was it? input no, manifest debug system General, uh, yes, here this we want to this turn off as well. Okay, that should probably already generate a reasonably clean code. We shall see if I d did not forget anything. Yep, that looks good enough. 
So in this case you see here um we load uh, first the address of our C string, then we call the constructor for our uh, std string. Now we don't need to take a look through that. The next step we call the unordered map function um well implementation of the square bracket operator. At some point we will see the square bracket. So you see also with templates, if you have too, m too complicated template things, you will end up with extremely long type definitions. So we have a square bracket operator here at the very end, but the m all the rest before uh, gets convoluted, so we will step over this as well. What this effectively gives us is um, it returns to us a reference <coughs> <coughs> on, the on a integer which is held somewhere inside this unordered map. Um this was returned yeah and here in the last step here we can um so the the address is in racks and then we can access this address uh with one call and assign zero to it. So there we do our actual assignment. Uh and then again we will need to call uh the destructor again for our string. Since we created a string here, just for the purpose of looking it up we now need to destroy it. Uh, so this will be done here. And once we're done with it, we can proce pro proceed to the next line. So you see that under the hood, a lot of is already happening here, and all of that is really just implemented at the same level as the code you are writing. So if you would be using some managed code, like for example C sharp, uh, the framework would offer you also such um, types that you could use for for storing data by key and by key and value, um, but there it would not implement those functionality uh, within it, its own language, I'll say, but rather it would just invoke uh, natively implemented functionality provided by the framework itself. Um, so, in, in a, as I, I think said already once, in a way C++ is the only language that is its own uh, fr framework and that does not um, at least from the ones that are modern use, I'm sure there are some obscure ones which might behave similarly, but from the ones that are commonly known, most things will be just at some point mapped into a, onto an implementation then that is then written in C++ at some point, uh, or in C uh, at some point, while, while C, C or C++ really uh, is just everything you and all you need and you will not need to transition to native code because you, you have native code directly at your disposal. Um, yeah, so any questions at this point? Yeah? Okay, so normally um, the square brackets are only defined on array type um, objects. So if you have an array, you can switch to this thingy. If this works, and it's uh, something's freezing. Um, uh, C plus plus test, yeah. So here we had our array somewhere. No, that's a hash table. Uh, <coughs> no, that's the point. I, it's an it's a class of type unordered map, and this class implements internally a hash table, like the hash table that 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 we had implemented earlier, just in pure C. But here it's really uh, using ob the objective functions of C plus plus. So you don't need to provide um, a pointer to which object it is, because the object kind of always is able to reference itself internally. And um, Mm -hmm. No. Uh, not quite. So here I don't overwrite anything. I use something that's already overwritten. And if you go to the definition here of in in this unordered map header file, which is provided by in this case Microsoft, uh, you see that they actually use this o uh, this square bracket operator. To they overwrite it here in this 
instance and then internally they just call some, some function which will return you a pointer to uh, what you want to return in the end good so any more questions here Um, so this is the key. So th the first thing, this is the key. So this is this. Whatever. So if if we would, let me uh, make another digits. Digits one. If we make it like this, that will be what we already had earlier. Suck. Digits one. So the first entry, so so the defini the template for this unordered map. If if we look up the template definition here, uh, you have template, then you have class key type, then you have type value, and then you have a lot of other things which have default values which we don't need to provide. So all this stuff we don't care about because it's already provided at least one default implementation. Uh, so for example, here it provides a hash function. Uh, so if we would want to provide an own hash function for our for this unordered map we could do that. We would not need to re rewrite everything, we could just provide only the hash function. Then the same thing with the function that will compare if those two, two elements are the same. In our own hash table we just use memory compare, but here uh, they uh, outsource this function to a defined um, comparison uh, function, which we could also overwrite, but we don't do that. So for us, only the first two entries are relevant. First the type and then whatever is the value that we call. So this this thing here, this could be also just our my class. So we could make it then my class and then we would need to assign th things of of type my class. But it since since my class does not have a assignment operator that will not work uh, well. <laughs> what we also could do that would maybe be a, a simpler example. Uh, let's call it uh, something. We can uh, assign a pointer to. Oops. Mm, can we can? Uh, and that of course that needs to be called something. So so if you if you have types that don't have copy uh, constructors and or assignment operators, you can usually try just using uh, pointers. Um, our scope pointer would of course not be a good choice because it uh, is not aware of other instances of itself, so that would not work. But for example, but without pointer, so in, in fact you could, for example, if you would want to extend this example here, we could use a uh, pointer detach. But then of course um, the pointer is then just stored here and it will no longer be destroyed when we uh, quit the scope of this. Uh, pointer variable. Any more questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions then uh, let's continue. So here as uh, said we already have seen most of the functionality. Uh, one of the more important functionalities that we already had uh, during the last um, lecture was the inheritance and functions which can be overwritten um, which uh, may, may might seem quite uh, quite useful in many in, in many scenarios but w one probably is, uh, you would also probably wonder how this internally works so if you call a function let's create another test example instead of using C++ test we create a new uh, thing you will call it um, CPP, uh, it's called CP extended, <coughs> extended testing. And what we will do here now, first we will of course just uh, make again a very simple test class. Uh, add class, um, how do we call that? My first, let's just call it my base. See my base. 
and let's call this classes age oops um, I based it oh no it changed our strings back And then just with within this we will actually don't need the CPP file for that. Uh, but let's leave it in maybe for now. Um, and here we will just then define um, again a derived class. Um, where's my where's that class derived from base? Um, So we have a, a, a constructor, then we want some int. Let's call it uh, m var. Let's initialize this to. Actually, let's, um, let's make it initializable with an arbitrary value, and then let's add uh, some functions. Uh, oops. Funk one and funk two. So include one thing. Hash include. Uh, as to the lib h. So that we can print f. F. Um, we can copy this. So so that we indicate what is being done. Funk one, funk two. Then let's derive like a derived class. So copy at least some things. My subclass. We just use the simple uh, initializer for the parent class. Okay, and now we can add another variable. Uh, mm, let's call it my. Let's call this my var one. Oops, this is complaining as to the lib. I think I need also as to the IO. Mm, right here. My var2. And then we will override those functions with our own. So as um, uh, so so far so good, so to say. Um, everything is as uh, simple as it gets. <coughs> <coughs> Let's include that. And let's first use just the base object and then let's just use the child object. So we create first simplest case see my base. Um yeah. Object one we need some value. On this we can call then func one and func two. Then we we make object to my uh, subclass. Oh, that will be our object number two. On which we again call function one and two. Um, and I said what this will effectively do is it will just call it on the other object. And what we then can do is we can create a pointer of this type. Um, Pointer to let's call that which will be a pointer to this reference. And if we call on this pointer uh, function one and function two, it will still invoke the right functions on our subclass. So we could in principle have this. Um, it must be public. Uh, pointer one, object one. Right. So, despite those two pointers having the exact same uh, type, we will see that internally the compiler will be aware that this pointer points uh, to something else. So, we see here uh, we have invoked once the functions that we expected, once the functions that, um, well, always the functions that we expected, once them that we invoked hardcode, and once those that we invoked right point, and here again the same thing. Now, just for demonstration purposes, if we would not say that those two functions are virtual, if we would operate on this pointer, 
you would go back to invoking the functions which are defined on the base. So you see here, it is not the function uh, that is now in called, which we wanted to call. And um, of course, if you would create a pointer with a different type, mm, pointer to b, let's call it, um, this type, uh, we can even assign this to that, uh, should we? No, it doesn't like that. Uh, we can cast it in any case. So uh, assigning the other way um, from a, a derived type to a parent type always works. If you're assigning uh, the other way around, the, thi the compiler will complain uh, unless you make explicit cast because um, I at this point it doesn't know whether point pointer 2 uh, actually has the, the, the type. So in one way it knows and in another way it doesn't. So we will we'll see later why, why this is and how this works. But the thing is that with this not yet fixed code, if we invoke it, we will see that if a function is not virtual, which child member is called, effectively... Um, oh yes, I did not call the right one. It should have been B. Effectively just depends on the type uh, of the pointer. So here you see, if the function is not virtual, as said, the pointer type defines which is access while if it is virtual so if we make it virtual again we will see that in any case we will always end up within the right function Suck. Um, yes okay yeah Yes. Um, so virtual, um, the the way it works is that internally it will allocate a function, a, a call table for every type uh, and for every object. And when you create an object, um, the object will get an additional hidden variable which we don't see here yet, um, which will point to the right call table and if you have a function like this the call is made directly there is no call table in between but if a function is defined as virtual then the call always goes through this call table and this means that uh, for every type for every pointer so every pointer every object pointed to by a pointer will have this additional variable which then points on the call table and when we try to call this function, there will be multiple steps of retrieving the right fu function address. And the idea is that the constructor of every subsequent subtype basically overrides the entries within the call table with the right ones for for it type it is it has. And then if this value is retrieved from the call table, it will point to function two and not to function one. To be ex and of course if we we would not have anything derived, and it just starts off with with, with pointing to function one. When we de derive something from it, for the derived type, the implemented call table will then just point to its version of function one. So here, with this example, now I just made one of the functions virtual. So we can uh, now run it again. So we will actually see very exactly how this um, behaves and misbehaves. So we see function one misbehaves while function two works always correctly and if we here uh, make uh, just a, a step through so a breakpoint and step through it you see that the call to function 1 is very trivial we just um, get into a RCX uh, our the address of the object we then directly make a call to function 1 and then Okay, we have a jump table, which I should an another one. This this one, this jump table is uh, because of this uh, linking thingy. So let quickly let me quickly disable that. What was it? Optimization system no, somewhere advanced. I think it was in general. Yes, general. Uh, Zack. No. Uh, one more thing to change. Um, general. No, generation. Nope, and 
No, okay. That will make a slightly more readable code. So we, as said, get our address of our object, and then we can here we just call this function and pass this address in RCX to it. So if we go inside, you see that without any detours, we directly end up in our uh, print in our func1 function. And if we go out of it, if we now try to call our function 2, which is a virtual function, you see, it starts um, in a way the same way. So first of all, we also get the address of our object. Um, but then we dereference already the first field inside this object into rags, then this is actually redundant. So we could have made it more efficient. So this could be line 1, and then we would just reference it to Rex, but well, it doesn't matter. But what we do here is we then call um, the address. So we call a function at the address of 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 uh, of the of um, our Rax register. So if we go through this step by step, we now will end up, of course, in function two. But as you have seen, to ad to arrive at this point, we needed a few more operations. And uh, just for uh, the demonstration, I will add some more virtual functions. Let's add a destructor because this is always good to have, and it only has to be virtual. We, uh, we need a body for that. We don't need to implement anything more. Mm. So here you see again now, now it changed from rax to rax plus eight because um, now the first entry in our jump table is the destructor. The second entry will be our function. And if we would have made both functions virtual again, and as I said, you don't need to write them as virtual in the derived um, classes. If they were once defined as uh, virtual, they will this this property is then inherited. So you don't need to explicitly write it down again. So now, if we again look into our code, we see that uh, again, of course, both are more complicated, and for each function, we go to the next position in our call table. Um, one thing we can also demonstrate um, at this point uh, can be an access to our variable one is like one, variable two is like two. So here we can we can deduce already a bit more from of the memory layout. So as said, first we take the address, then so now the address of the object. So if we go uh, one step, then Rax contains our pointer, intermediate, clear all. Okay, it doesn't know the type, we need to give it the type here. Uh, oops. So now Rax just contains uh, our pointer. We did not initialize variable 2, so it's chunk, variable 1 is correct. Um, and then add it will read here in this line the first uh, memory, the first offset in memory within this object. So that would be equivalent to um, void asterisk asterisk dereference. Okay, so let's do this step. So now we cannot use fax anymore. But as you see, wait, did that work? Okay, that's the wrong notation. Uh, where's the hex button? Here's the hex button. So you see here we have read the right thing, and you see that this memory addresses is some v table of size four. So there are four functions in our v table, and it's defined somewhere in our function. So this already is the function address. So if we would want to go to there, um, wait, sorry, that's the address of the of the of what holds the function. We need to dereference this once more. Um, Stern, stern, stern. Yes, uh, and also we don't want the first one. Uh, well, that, that's where the things start being funny. So, as I said, in the racks we are currently holding the pointer to our uh, jump table, which is, um, for reasons of optimizations, it's always the same jump table used by all of the types that you have. So, if you in, uh, initialize multiple instances of a given type, 
they will all have a point at the same jump table because the jump table for a given type is always the same so there's no point in having it like hundreds of times um, but as I said so here we have our jump table for into into RCX we load the address again of our object because we want this for for the for the calling convention so that we can use the this um, keyword inside and then here from our jump table we take something at the offset um, plus 8 so we don't want the so the first one as you see is the destructor if we make plus oops that was the wrong key if we make plus 8 it gives us the function 1 and if we make plus 16 so 10 uh, in hex notation it gives us function 2 so at this point when we do the next line uh, this one suck we will be jumping at this address in function 1 suck. and then uh, inside um, at some point here yeah um, we save uh, RCX to our stack and then we can uh, then reload it again which is a bit useless but I said this is op unoptimized code and then we can do some internal thingies in our function which we don't care about right now and now if we try like by hand to access some fields you see that this, this is quite quite similar so again we start with our object we load it to rex and then we can access it at uh, rex plus 8 so obviously here we loaded um, rex plus 0 because it's the first entry and then the second entry is rex plus 8 and then rex pl plus 16 so in reality in before this entry there is some hidden by the compiler created invisible um, watch them, um, feed table uh, which has a size of 4 so this co this con why is it 4? 1, 2, it should be only 3 um, I guess the last one is not used uh, we'll make plus 16 oops um, plus uh, what's the next 20 no, uh, 24. Um, why doesn't that work? Or did I already stop that? No, that should be working. I have one. I uh, want too many. Okay, so at this address there is nothing. So they created apparently internally a slightly bigger um, table. But they have not. Uh, but they have not uh, for some, or maybe the just the display here is wrong. So we would need to disassemble the whole, whole file to find out whether there really is like s enough room for the f for the for for a fourth entry, or if for some reason the s intelligence here just is um, showing us one element too many. Uh, so I said if we de devirtualize function one again. Um, if we would do the same thing, our V table would only have um, <laughs> uh, would only have uh, one entry less. So let's mm, we don't want this function. Now we want to virtual. So here we have our V table in ranks. Um, yeah. So as you see, it is uh, now one less. Um, I don't know why it apparently creates one dummy entry, but it does. The last one doesn't point to anything, as you have seen. The it does not resolve to a valid function. So this, as I said, is is hidden inside our class. And what we can do, in fact, uh, we could write an object. Basically, we could write a C file. So without C plus plus, that could uh, still uh, interact with this C++ um, class and do things with this uh <coughs> uh, pointer table so we can uh, demonstrate it, let's create a C file new item yeah yes Mm -hmm. 
um, it's optional so the override you you need to define things as virtual and if you write override the only thing that this really does is that if the virtual if the function which you are trying to override would not be virtual it would throw an error or an a or a warning so it does not not do functionally anything it just helps you to find a bug so um if you would change at some point uh, something in your base class and make something no longer virtual that was previous virtual and somewhere further down in your code you would actually have used the virtuality of that function if you explicitly say that this function is supposed to override something then um, then it would uh, throw an error so we can actually demonstrate that so let's see let's uh, function what was it um, so now if we try to compile it it is fine and then if we remove the virtuality of, oops, of function 1 and try to compile again it uh, throws an error so it helps you to, to find the fact that someone or you has removed your virtual entry earlier as simple as that so the important thing is virtual override is just uh, and nice to have and also I don't think this override keyword was available in like in in arbitrarily old versions of C++ so initially uh, it so they added a lot of um, features that are known from other languages uh, which help to avoid errors back to C++ so for example in uh, C sharp you, you always needed this override keyword um, but in C++ since they wanted this backwards compatibility while they added those keywords so that you can use them they haven't made any of this mandatory um, although I guess there's with some compilers you may be able to set options for example to require you to always specify override and, and stuff like that but this is not the default configuration since by default you should be able to compile old code uh, at least within reason. So there are some things that they changed in the defaults, like you can no longer use uns this unsafe functions uh, without specifying that you actually want to do that. But other than, but I think this is really the only thing that the Microsoft compiler, by default, and for uh, made different than what you would expect from a normal C compiler. And they did it for for a good security reason, so that's excusable. But anyhow, yeah, yes. Yeah, there is a YouTube channel for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where were we? What do we want to do? Yes, we wanted to uh, mess around with our C++ objects using nothing more but just uh, plain C. So we need some includes. As always, everything starts with a few good includes. So the, uh, S -T -T -U. Uh, S -T -D Yep. Um, and let's make a function void uh, my test which will take a void pointer um, let's call this base and uh, void pointer let's call this uh, sub now we want to call this from our C++ so if you want to call something uh, from S uh, something in C from C++ uh, you might run into issues with the calling convention so we can quickly demonstrate that so we have here our yes and maybe we should turn off all these functions Oops. since we don't want them to interfere with our nice log lines my test and we want to pass it first was the base so that was this object and then we had the derived object ok that should be a reference the object 2 is the derived one I'm not sure if we will be using both but for, oops. but for now let's do it and I guess if we try to compile it it should throw a linker error um, and it did so as you see it didn't find my test despite the fact that we defined that there is a my test and despite the fact that we actually have a my test here and the reason is that in C files and CPP files by default the calling convention is slightly different or rather at least the decoration of symbols is slightly different 
So we need to tell the compiler here that this function is not C++ but in C. It doesn't work the other way around. So you cannot put easily a C uh, function into uh, so is a C++ function into uh, into C, but a C function into C++ works fine. You just need to write this extend C. We could also write this like in one in one line like this, but uh, like this allows you to add m some more definitions and save on typing in the long run. So now this will compile. And um, now if we go here, we can see that uh, we just get some memory, which the compiler at this point doesn't even tell us what it is. So uh, if we, we can of course um, try to tell the compiler, the well in this case the ID, the exact type, or at least a type. Uh, it, can al and it can be the parent type, so with base it's anyways the one, and with sub. Um, one thing you already see is that even we said that bo in both cases it's it's base. The thing knows here internally that actually um, the thing is of the subtype, so it can already find out. Ah, that this might be what it uses the third entry for in the V table now. When I think about it, uh, to save some type information for this uh, for this functionality. Um, but anyhow, so let's uh, go back to our definitions here. Um, suck. We need to make some sort of stand-in object. Let's call it uh, as my base. And we know that this. Wait, do we know that is? The, have I uncommented everything? Yes. So it should be again f four. Uh, that is not quite correct. That should be a pointer on a v table. Um, let's just a pointer on a pointer. Let's just go with void asterisk and think later about what what's the right pointer. Although, no, actually, I can I c we can make it better. Um. <sighs> Do it like this. So now this will be a um, pointer on an array of function pointers. Um, in this case, it says all the function functions don't take any argument and they, and they all return void, which might not be true. But for for simplicity, let's let's stay with that. Now let's create a child object, um, my uh, subclass. Which uh, this is like this, and here just contains uh, my base base. Um, well, it would be nice to put it underscore. And uh, wait, why is it complaining? Uh, that thing should be happy with that actually. Um, yeah. Oops. Um. With C you can use uh, definitions directly, uh, sorry, with C++ you can use definitions directly, while with C you always need to explicitly type def them out, which is inconvenient, but uh, let's do it properly. I mean, in principle we could just go without that, that would also work, but normally you are supposed to keep the name also in your structure definition. So. We have those two things. Um, in this way, we can kind of not directly call anything on them yet. Mm, but yeah. Doesn't matter the name. The names in C plus plus. Basically, every variable could be called var1 until var however many billion you have uh, without names, so the names are completely relevant. Um, in fact, I can quickly demonstrate that here um, with a very simple example. Um, let's say s1 um, int var1 
then we just duplicate the structure, we call it S2. So these are completely different structures for what the thing is for the compiler for, for what the compiler is concerned. Um they have completely different names, everything's different about them. We will allocate one of them on the on the stack. We'll make a pointer to the other one. PS2. And then we'll take reference on our S1. Then we'll first will in S1 assign a few things. So this is one one two. Um three four five six. And here um print F Protzen D, Protzen D, Protzen D, Comma, S2, Oops, S2, Was it S2? No, PS2, it was PS2, Var A, P, C, Oops, So, we have completely different names, we are casting two types on each other which are incompatible, which the compiler actually is warning us about um, and yet it will just work fine and print the values in the order which they are in there so as you see here it printed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and as I said the names completely doesn't matter I it's just m a label for memory area Oops. This annoying auto complete. I should turn that off. There is somewhere an option to turn this off. Okay, but anyhow, um, let's go back to our class. As I said the name doesn't matter. Uh, so we have our object. We can call things on our object, and now we want to cast it. So we make our s base. Asterisk. Let's call this just p space type. <laughs> and well, actually, we don't really care for the for the other sample. Let's just go with only object 2 because that's the only thing that really matters to us and let them just call it pointer. Uh, I need to change this here as well. Suck. So we cast this on tube base and wha one thing we could already do is we could access in B our variable 1 uh, so point F oops what's in D comma and maybe one more fix to our reference class. So here we will assign this the value to just so that uh, we don't have uninitialized variables. And now if we run it, we'll see uh, that printf will write out here the value of 1. Um, okay, we need to go past this breakpoint. Yeah, now it should be there. Yep. And we can then also um, cast. Uh, this thing, um, let's call this uh, my subclass. S. Yes. Uh, let me see. And now we can comma should be there. Use one and two. I see. Put in D. Put in D. So here, ah, that was two. We can access um. It should be an S. It's uh, a huh? Ah, uh, we defined it this slightly differently. Let's just call it B. Um, we could have just copied everything from 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 here to here directly. Uh, that would um, then make the object look the same. But I think this. Uh, where did we write? Ah, yes, okay, so we write 1, 1 from here, and then we write 1, 2, and 3. Did I initialize it with 3? I in uh, that should be 2. Why is that not 2? Uh, did we do something to it? Yes, we did something to it here. Uh, right, yo, so it works as expected. So for now, we can comment this out. Um, maybe we should add a backslash n here just in case. And now what we will be wanting to do is we will be wanting to call our function 1 and function 2 um, from the v table directly. So 
Um, let's do that. We need uh, something for this. So base is s base const asterisk. Wouldn't need to be const, but since we are casting later, it's fine anyways. Um, yes. Let me think. Yeah. Um that will work that will be working. So um oops at a void asterisk const void asterisk klamatsu klamatsu um object table then we need the function indices for those two functions um, let's use an enum for that uh, enum um, we don't need to give it a name since we are using it only as an enum fun, uh, func one ah, that will be already one since uh, the structure is uh, index zero just uh, yeah, first. This will auto increment, so we don't need to write them down. We just need to write commas. Function one and function two. So we take it at the offset function one. So at position one. Then we need to make brackets along the whole thing again. And uh, I might have put the brackets not quite where I need them. Let's see. If this is correct, and the strich point, yes, enough casts, everything works out fine. So let's go for two, and then just we need to put the address here. Then we can use our special call wrapper to call. Um, well, it just takes space, but this is fine if we use the parent. Uh, we do cannot because we don't have inheritance in normal C. So we need to pass it the base. What is it complaining about? Um, yes, it needs to be a reference. One, two. Yeah, and if we run this, it will now properly invoke the two, the right two virtual functions on our subclass. So again, to go back to this example, we can call our test function twice for the one for the first object and for the second object. And as you will see. For object one, which uh, is well, object one, it will just call the norm. Um, okay, this was not. <laughs> um, so for object one, this is of course invalid because it's not derived from anything. Uh, this, in fact, will work because it's kind of just a dirty hack. But the variable, uh, the second variable, just does not exist, so it just has garbage there. But it still calls the right functions, and here, of course, for our derived object which has a value for our uh, var2, it, uh, it, it wrote that properly. Um, and now if we would want to do that, so this now, the way this is now implemented works uh, for 64-bit. Uh, if we would want to do it into in 32-bit because of different calling conventions, we would need to do this slightly different so we can comment that out um, or rather disable it so if if def um, m underscore x64 so so this part of code is now only for the 64 bit case and now we want for the 32 bit case or any other case uh, for that matter given this semantics but of course um, we only have those two cases, so we will go with that. We will implement that in a working way. Um, let's. We can actually modify those, I think, without re rewriting too much. We just need to specify the right calling convention. This call. Is that everything? I think that is everything that we need. Yep, let's try it out. Yes.
This thing? Which one? This this thing. Okay, so if you have a a preprocessor variable of this name, then enable this code, else enable whatever comes after it. Or if you would have just it's like an if just with the like a normal if and else if just with a preprocessor. So this is executed during compile time and allows you to have code for different architectures, different platforms in the same file, and then just depending on which uh, preprocessor uh, variables you have defined, you can by the way define them here, so you go in project properties uh, preprocessor, here you can define them for, for your, so for example I mean one thing is you will not see all of them here because um, they are uh, th some of them are inherited and some of them are appended by the uh, compiler directly, so like the the Unicode one comes from a template uh, somewhere in the in the framework, but the m underscore x64 is defined by the compiler if it is a compiler for x64 directly. Um, okay, but let's return to this thing. Something is not quite right. Why doesn't this work? This should be working. If we sp with the right calling convention, mm, I think that might not work because we have created here a C file, and this this call thing is a C plus plus sort of thing, so we can quickly uh, rename this into a CPP file. That is rather a dirty hack, but it should help us getting this example to work. No, it still doesn't work. Ah, so now, now now we have a different error because this we said it's external C, so we quickly uh, break this as well. Um, huh? This okay. Then we just don't need any brackets. Uh, now it will compile. Is that okay? Now it needs to load a few uh, debug symbols since we have not run a a 32-bit application with here recently needs to update a few things um, that will undo that uh, since kind of the goal of using plain C would be in fact to okay, so you see uh, it worked again as expected so the goal of using uh, this in plain C would be that you don't need the don't, don't want the overhead of um, what the what a full C++ compiler would bring so rename Back to C, and um, okay, this will. You can just write down. This doesn't work. And if we switch to 64-bit again, then this macro will be defined. So that's okay. It didn't switch again. And then this code is disabled and this code is enabled again. So, any questions at this point? Okay, if there are no questions, then what we also could do is we could try to create our own v table <laughs> to um fully operate those this thing with it without um having to use uh normal c plus plus so uh we can do that by first defining uh our two functions um two, 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 right. Base func eins um, asterisk object, and then uh, we just have the same thing for function two. Aha, one more thing. Uh, okay, now this one. Base and subclass. And then let's quickly copy our print f we'll slightly adapt this in a second so here we just will write base 
Or maybe we should write. I mean, it doesn't matter just for the output. And here we will make a sub class. That should be function two. Okay, so we have the two functions defined. We have our indices already defined. Then it's time to create our V tables. Ah, one problem. We don't have a destructor. Um, let's just throw the destructor out for now. Uh, yeah, well, then this will be commented out and this will become zero. Uh, okay, okay. So, um, void slash base v, v table. Um, should be right. Right. Asterisk strichpunkt and base function one. Base function two. Then we do the same for subclass. Subclass V table, um, and then of course it's subclass function one and subclass function two. Wait, I just killed the line that was not intentional. Zack. Yes. So let's extend our example. Let's make this our test able be able to return a pointer of its own nah, that, is, uh, that is ugly, let's do my test 2 or something um, merge turn my test 2 and we call this my test 1 um, my test 1 my test 1 <sighs> my test 2 and we want this, we want in principle, that's what we want. Um, pointer three is equals. We will be creating this object here. It doesn't take arguments, and then on this thing we will be calling function one and function two. Uh, yes, yes. We don't need any arguments for our test two. Zack. Um, Zack. That is now called test one. Then here we add our test two. Okay, okay. So uh, since we want to be able to return that, we will need to allocate it. Um, that is good that we have removed our destructor because uh, the destructor would now be a bit problematic. Since for now um, we will have to use uh, malloc to allocate our memory. size of my subclass ok then so we have our object we need to set the v table so uh, base punct v table is equal so this are the right thing so the v table is our subclass v table um, yeah and we also wanted to initialize uh, the variable one with one, and let's initialize variable two with two. Okie dokie. So now, if we go until here, let's go here. Uh, we expect this to work. Let's see if it actually works. Um, zack, zack. So you see already the the call is the same the same way implemented as it was it would be for these upper functions here if they if we wouldn't have commented them out. So it takes a few operations and then it, we go with our call to our subclass function one. So that looks promising. And if we run it and check, it uh, wrote as it should. Um, the right functions were called. So uh, this basically is a manual implementation of how all these nice features of C++ work under the hood. So 
um, if you want to optimize some code extremely and not use C++ but would for some reason have to handle a C++ object that is passed to you for example by some API then uh, this would be how you could do it you just need to really well understand the structure of your object implement the right ob uh, objects yourself and then with the right function calls you can make it work so here it's complaining about something uh, but it's it compiled, so I don't know why it's complaining. It should be fine. Okay, it just says that that uh, s could be null because malloc is defined such that uh, it uh, can return an, a null value. So we could here. Um, we forgot. Huh. We forgot to return s, but accidentally it worked. <laughs> uh, the reason really was because s was still in rex, and rex is the register. Which uh, expects to be uh, to keep the return return value. So um, this is a worrisome aspect of C++ that um, you can write things the wrong way and still have them work to some extent, despite that they really should not. So ideally, if you don't, if you forget to return a value, then this should either not compile at all or break uh, just outright but obviously as said um, in this particular case it worked just fine so uh, what you of what it of course does is it creates warnings and this is why we have here this setting uh, somewhere called generation um, was it general? it's called yeah here treat warnings as error so if we enable this um, and again forget to return s then it will fail the compile process and I would recommend if you are writing uh, stuff in C especially in C C++ is slightly uh, more uh, strict to begin with but if you're writing something just in C then I would really recommend to uh, set your compiler to treat every uh, warning as an error uh, because um, if there is a warning then there is a poten potential for, for a screw up and usually for a big one so uh, this really helps to avoid uh, problems further down the line because if you write bad code and it still works in a given scenario it's absolutely not guaranteed that it will uh, work in any other so in this case the main reason why this worked simply was because apparently the compiler decided to use the rex register uh, to to hold uh, the point the value of s and it played out well but of course if the compiler would then be set to uh, optimize the code for example it might not do that or it might choose another register um, or even if it's just a different compiler that will by default op for example call uh, select uh, rbx or, or something um, it will just make the code not uh, behave in a really deterministic way if you no, don't pay attention to all the warnings that that are there. Um, good, any questions at this point? No questions? Not even a single one. Um, okay. Good. Um, so, of course, one thing to notice is that you probably will never have to use th such tricks, but so you also not you you also will not need this for for like um, homework. It just I just wanted to demonstrate it really in detail how these objects are constructed, such that you will have a good understanding of how C++ internally implements this whole functionality. Um, yeah.
Mm -hmm. Um, well, you could you could use a you could of course use a different function, but the idea here is that we wanted to emulate the same behavior as normal C would do. You could put any other. I mean, you, the the function needs to be in the table, but of course we could swap, for example, one and two, and if the functions take the same arguments, this would work. Just make your code behave really strange <laughs> because it's kind of you are calling function one and, and it's doing function two instead uh, but yeah that would work and maybe one more thing I could demonstrate here what we can do in fact let's create a test three um, mm, is we could in fact use this knowledge to manipulate how a program or class uh, would behave so Let's comment out those things. Oops. Let's enable again our this this two things. And here, what we do, we'll, we'll be calling our test three on this pointer. So I'll just quickly create an empty test three, which doesn't do anything. Uh, just for for the start, so now you will see it will just behave normally as soon as it starts doing something. Yep, so it just um, calls um, the, the function, the two functions as expected, although uh, what do we, we have uncommented too much, we don't need this, we don't need that, we don't need this as well, we are only interested in those two things, okay, so let's run this again. Well, actually, um, I probably should have left the other ones enabled for demonstration purposes. So here, um, uh, no. let's to make this as clear as possible. Use the same pointer. So we have here the same pointer. So in the normal case, we have twice the same behavior bef before we start screwing with the class. And now, what we can do here inside, so we know already what this thing is supposed to do so let's uh, scroll it a bit we will create a uh, we will create another V table but this time one that we control um, and we will implement a function mm, somewhere here let's call it function 3 and we should give it somebody. Uh, let's give it. Let's give it function three. We don't care for the object, so it's function three. So this is a function which, as such, uh, does not exist anywhere on the object. Okay, okay let's see how to do that. So um, definitely need a pointer. Um, new v table. Um, look, that's file L. size of uh, voyage 10 times uh, 3. We learned that it needs to be 3 size, at least for this particular type. Now uh, we can mm, then copy the rest of the V table. As size we have and here we know that it is the first entry so actually we could uh, uh, um, just take it like this so now we make a copy of the original v table now in the v table we know that this v table is basically just something like this so we can call it um Will that be fine here? That should be fine. So V table at offset uh, what was it? Zero. Let's let's say we want to hack function zero. Will be equals um our my func number three. And now what we will do? We will overwrite the original V table with our handmade V table. 
and unless I screwed something up now what, what I expect to happen is that well here it will call uh, what it should call here why did I override zero one zero okay so let's align this with our comment uh, call our func three um suck uh, yeah let's just run it might crash or it will work let's see okay so uh, the we have a warning treated as an error um okay memcob is undefined because we need to in include string h uh, yep and voila it worked so <laughs> um now to add an even more impressive demonstration um we will add here some function that does something void uh it won't it won't it doesn't matter whether it's virtual or not let's just keep it normal void to nothing uh, just let's call it void do ah, and here what we do is we call our function to now since the function is virtual the normal behavior when calling do something is of course we still expect even if we call it on base to break out and call function to from the subclass so um, instead of those things we just um, let's, let's comment this out since we want to keep that as demonstration do something and again do something Oops. and do something will also be redirected so now what we did basically uh, with, with this hack is we not just changed how this object uh, presents and acts towards um, external classes we have also changed how the uh, object will internally do its internal processing so if uh, we would want to manipulate some behavior of a of a class that we know the structure of we could indeed do it this way so now we can really go through this step by step and we will see that when we enter this call and then want to call basically this func2 what effectively happens is that it is redirected to our function 3 so um, very complex internal processes of a existing class if we for whatever reason could not change this class we could still so say hack uh, to do whatever we, we want it to do by this method and what this method does is it changes it only for this one instance of the class so th there is of course another um, thing we could do namely uh, to change this behavior for any instance so if we uh, here again create now a new object um, of type object uh, of this type object 3 oops, can come up. and call on, on object 3 uh, do something uh, we need to give it a value um, this to something is not affected by the hack that we have applied here it will just n we don't want the breakpoint it will just normally do its func2 uh, but instead of uh, my test 2 uh, 3 we could also do my test 4 <sighs> my test 4 and my test 4 is the much more invasive version because it changes the behavior of everything uh, just globally um, team 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 so in principle we just call this v table just cast this here then we can override this global v table um, although it might be that w when we try to do that we will now run into a memory protection so it could be that the compiler will put this original v table in a read only area in memory we will see um, that actually failed 
without crashing quite as it failed. I did it failed. Um. Table. Did. Wait, we are missing. I'm missing one thing somewhere. Um. Yes, that is what we are missing. Okay. <laughs> uh, so now we have the expected uh, write access violation. So we can actually fix that. Um, just, just need to include Windows H. And what was it? Um, Get what protect uh, address v table size is this comma new protect um what was it uh, uh was it uh, read read right uh one moment please there is some prefix to the to the name. I don't remember at the moment. Um, um team 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 virtual protect flags memory protection constants. Ah, right yo. So it's prefix of page execute read write. So now we have a uh, memory which is executable, readable and writable something that is usually usually unsafe to have hence um, it is usually customary to save the old value into a variable do whatever one, one wanted to do and then restore their original page protection just to be on the safe side um, I mean for us it's irrelevant but that what you would normally do. So now we will be able to overwrite it. And now, as you see, we not just change the behavior of the current object, but of all the objects that will ever be created within this process. Uh, we have redirected this function call to our own function, which is not even written in um, C, C++. It is just a normal uh, C function. So we can even demonstrate it that it actually works. Uh, properly by allowing it access to variable 1 since this is only defined on base function 3 Wait, we, we, we have overwritten function 2 right so actually we could uh, uh, tim, 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 we could actually put here the subclass and access both of them percent t um, 2 and here a set since this is p the base, uh, yeah, well, so let's run this again. And voila, we have demonstrated that we really have access to all the data within the object, that everything works as it should, despite the fact that uh, it's very, very manipulated. <laughs> so, um, that much to this. Are there any more questions? this one okay so the idea so the memory protection allows you to define for every page of memory whether this the code there is where well, the memory there is readable writable and or executable and um, normally in an ideal safe scenario you would want your memory to be either writable or executable but never both at the same time because if it is writable then some bug of the program some wrong memory access may write something over your executable code and uh, if this program processes user input this something may be some malicious code provided by the user so the user can um, input something that will cause your program to do an invalid memory access and whatever he provided be overwritten into that memory region so if this memory is only readable and writable but not executable 
um, he can destroy data in, in the memory of your program and but this usually will only end up in the program crashing it will not allow him to execute arbitrary code on the machine if however this memory area is executable and he writes some malicious own code there once the program will jump to this area of memory and since it's executable there is the assumption that at some point it will then the, u the malicious user managed to get his code to be executed on your computer or on your server or alike and then he has control over what the program will do next from this point on and here the idea is that we can that this virtual protect function will save whatever was the old value of memory protection flags to this old variable and once we did our writing to the executable memory as soon as we are done we restore it such that it will only be ex uh, executable and read only actually here we don't even need to set this executable since we only want to write to it you could just set it to read write and uh, the original value will be restored here once um, we are done with the function any more questions No more questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, there is maybe one quick thing that w that I could show you that is a, a possible in C++ but not in normal C. But let's for that open again our initial CPP test project and it is called uh, lambda functions so as you see un so until now you always write the functions either just as a standalone function within your file or you write the function uh, as a part of a class or a struct or any other object um, and what we have never done is r we have not written a function within another function so this of course one might uh, ask whether that is useful or what it would be useful for but in fact it is quite convenient to do so uh, in in C you cannot do that and in all the versions of C++ I think before C11 this was not even supported but starting with C11 and now we are at C22 I think um, I mean it's not like uh, there was arbitrary man in between I think there was like a C17, C22 we have now and uh, there might have been C15 at some point so it's like just a year in which this was uh, ratified rather than just a version number that, that, that is counted through but nowadays you can do it so um, let's do it and one more thing uh, this auto keyword is also very useful if you don't know which type you will end up with you can just type write auto and the C++ compiler will pick the right type for you this also doesn't work with um, normal C and this also does not work with C older than C11 so auto my funk um, that was the semantic it was the keyword I think that was like this say return one uh, or let's give it something um, int a int b return a plus b and um, we can do one more thing uh, right, no, no, but int c is equals 4 um, you can write c here and then you can use c within your lambda function so you have a function here which basically takes two arguments, returns an integer and is able to access a variable outside although the way it, access it accesses, accesses it now will be just by copy and not uh, by reference so if we call the function int d is equals my func uh, 1 comma 2 um, let's return d so that we have something to break on okay so the uh, yep that's the right value and 
now if we try to change C here and C is like let's say it's free. Um, if it works up according to standard, that should have no effect on the result value. Yep, you see it's still 7, despite the fact that we changed C now to 3. If we however make a reference C, then... Um, so this, this thing here is called the CAPTCHA list, in which you can specify what things from your current scope you want to use. You could also specify, I think, just the end symbol, which would mean that you can then access everything uh, by reference from your scope. So let's quickly demo that, and then we will demo the ex explicit case. So we see here now, as soon as it shows something, it has an effect, and if we would uh, explicitly make at C, then it would also be have the same effect. The changes to C would propagate to within our function, and. Uh, but the idea generally is that, of course, you just select the variables. Okay, we don't have any others here, so let's save also the D uh, and some E variable. But you only se specify those variables you oops, you need and not just everything, because um, uh, specifying too much will, in fact, limit the functionality of your lambda function. So one thing that can be done with such a function is you can pass it on to another function to do something. So for example, uh, we had, um, I think, with one of the other examples, the, a method where I said you can pass, for example, a comparison function to some function that will then internally perform something. And this is, for example, where a lambda function would be very convenient, because you would not, you would, you would just write it at the po place in the code where you are right now, and you would not need to uh, put it somewhere outside your function, which it might be less convenient. Plus, as said, w to some extent you can access those variables uh, from your scope, although this, as said, limits the functionality or the univers universality rather of, of your lambda function. So let's here create a test function. Uh, call lambda, which we'll just call a lambda function. And the th problem is here we actually need a type, so let's first start with a lambda function that just is uh, like this. Um, two, 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 int fx. Yeah, let's call it int. So now we call return fx. Uh, we will need some arguments for it, probably. Int a, let's say a, and 1, 2, 3. So one, one parameter is fixed, the other one is variable. So now here, instead of doing this, we would do call lambda. Uh, we pass our lambda function. We pass a Argument um, and we want still to see the result. And if we call this, this will work just fine. It will invoke and a set. Uh, oh no, what did I? Okay, we. I have the. Oh yes, I defined the here. Um, let's go with C before I at arrive at C. Some time will pass. <laughs> so if we run that. Z will have just the operation result as expected. And as said, the function here could be arbitrarily complicated and even invoke other functions to which it would then pass our fx pointer. And um, this way you can, in a quite flexible way, make things um, work uh, in a flexible way. So you can implement some code which does a part of a logic, but it's flexible enough that you can pass it any function. Usually you would do it with some arbitrary additional types, but in this case we had just a very simple demo. And the problem is that if we would try to capture something, like let's see, say we want to capture C by value, uh, this changes the function signature and this will not longer work, so it's already here under underscoring it. Because the function as it was like this, was equivalent to if I would have just put it in here int underscore, let's call it underscore my func that, that is exactly the... why is that complaining? should not be complaining, no it's not complaining, sorry it is exactly the same thing but if we start using a capture list this n is not longer let's say that simple 
and one thing we could do is we could use templates um, and then here use f so, so t uh, type tfx and now this is working so when we can when we make a breakpoint here mm, or not uh, right yo that was too too much copy and pasting copy and pasting without thinking is dangerous <laughs> that's a good uh, thing to keep in mind um and as you see it just jumps to the right function at the right place um and then it would of course execute it one more thing we can do we can also try um by reference that will work just the same way so again it just jumps to wherever this function happens to be implemented and then it and then it can execute uh, some operations although now we haven't used the c uh, yeah no yeah, no we, we used it so it's actually go up to our c okay we can have this uh, yeah and the C is A B. It takes C from somewhere. Um, that I have not yet looked into how exactly it structures the memory because in principle the function is uh, is, is here, but you you should be able to call this function from multiple threads at the same time. So in some way it must create for every execution every invocation of main a copy of either the whole function or a copy of a um, data pointer that will it will pass to this function which will then contain our uh, address of the C variable um, so this is something to maybe look into in some at some point but um, for most cases you know you don't need to care how the compiler really does the things it does uh, you just need a general understanding how they would uh, operate so I said in this case the important thing to um, take away so to say is that um, Normally, a function must be enterable uh, from as many. So y you must be able to call the function from multiple threads at the same time without um, the results of the operation starting to interfering with each other. Of course, if you do something like um, static C at this at, at, at the instance when you have something static in your function, then it is no longer reentrant because then um, multiple functions calling it uh, at the same time, multiple threads calling the function at the same time will probably not behave correctly unless you are very careful with what you use the, the static element for. Same thing as is if this function would be using some global variables um, y then you would usually want to, go to guard this global or static variables with some synchronization objects um, I think I mentioned those already the last time but since we are approaching the end of the lecture anyways when we have four minutes left, I think I will not start anything new. Instead, I will ask if there any if there are any questions. Are there or not? Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Um these brackets are called a capture list and what they do is they allow you from within the function to access stuff that is outside the function within the scope where the function was defined. Okay, any more questions? A and B are the arguments for the function. So here, when we call it, in this case, for example, uh, A is one and B is two. So if you type this and the open case, and the intelligence shows you int A and B. So it tells you what 
arguments you can pass. 72, yes? 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 And B will be 1, 2, 3. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. If there are no more questions, then we are done for today. And uh, this time we did not have any homework. Um, well, good enough, I guess. <laughs> um, and for the next lecture, I will think about some project that you will then have till the end, uh, or maybe for the lecture afterwards. I will. I will need to find uh, think of a project for you that you will um, be able to do as a um, final project for the for the lecture. So like a extra large homework for which you will have um, four weeks or so. Um, I will announce that either next time or at the 2nd of uh, June what that will be. Um, I think it will be something uh, with reading files and storing the data read in some own sort of data structure. I think this should be easy enough. Um, if you want to prepare for that already, what you could try to do um, would be to uh, convert the simple Actually, that actually sounds like an easy enough homework. Uh, yeah, we could do that, but I think since we are running out of time and have many people already left, I will still sh schedule that uh, only the next week. But what it will be, uh, so the homework f that I will probably schedule next week will be, so the still the normal homework will be to uh, convert the hash table example into uh, from C uh, to C++. This is not really difficult. Um, and probably it would be good if I would show you how to do that with the simple list example. Yeah, that makes sense. That sounds like it would make it easy. Um, so th just to summarize, th the idea is that you no longer have like an object and functions where you always need to pass uh, this object into, but instead where you really just can uh, call functions on this object kind of the same way as we could do it, where was the demo, with this uh, digit 1 and digit 2 and digit so on uh, on the ex on the thing that we already here already had, so that actually we, actually we did not do it, but the thing is you could also instead of the um, ov uh, overloaded thing use the insert command so yeah, but anyhow we the time is running out and I should not keep you too long. I will uh, think about it a bit more and as I said next time give you the homework with converting C to C++ and on the 2nd of June come up with a final with a final project that will be within your skill level achievable. Okay, so yes? Um it would be better if you do it by your own. Because if you want to do it in a group, then I would need to think of a project that is twice as complicated to make it fair, and that would mean more work for me. <laughs> Plus it makes it complicated, which might not necessarily be a sort of problem that becomes easier if you do it in groups. So I think uh, making doing it individually is good. Or let's let's do it differently. If you think uh, think up of if you think up a project. Uh, you can apply with a group to do it, and if I deem it complicated enough, then you then you can do it in a group. That sounds fair enough. And it doesn't mean more work for me. <laughs> so, any more questions about the final project? Okay, if there are none, then have a nice day. Bye-bye.